Good morning, um, everyone, and welcome to our webinar. Um, when we started discussing this webinar on the optimistic days of the summer, we were talking about doing a webinar about how everyone could um, manoeuvre themselves back into the office in a compliant way. Um, unfortunately, since then, things have taken a bit of a turn for the worse in relation to the um, pandemic. And so we thought it would be useful um, to bring together our experts from across the firm um, to talk in, on, in a holistic way about um, reviewing the position now that we're in a situation where it looks like we're going to be working from home for a lot longer than we perhaps hoped in the summer. Um, and specifically what financial services businesses need to think about um, at the moment um, in relation to the longer term plan, um, because both as financial services businesses regulated by the FCA in a regulated environment, but also as businesses in general, um, look at what uh, is going to happen moving forward as we stay at home for a while. Um, there is, as we all know now, hope on the horizon um, in the last few days. And I heard um, the health uh, experts for the government speaking this morning and talking about us being able to get back to a more normal way of life by about the middle of next year. Um, but that's still, still a few months to go um, before that happens. And so um, I, it'd be good to hear from our experts about uh, what businesses can be thinking about over the next, um, over the next few weeks to prepare for that. Um, so we'll start by looking at the employment law issues that arise. Um, and we've got Catherine Burke from our employment team to talk about that. Hi everyone, good morning. Um, thank you for the introduction, Janine. Um, as Janine has said, I'm an associate here in the Collierso employment team. I'm going to be talking to you about some of the employment issues rise as the workforce continues to work from home. We're going to be talking about when employees should be working from home, health and safety when working from home, and, and employee monitoring and surveillance. Firstly, as you will all know, the government has advised that we all work from home again. However, the guidance is more nuanced than it was in March. The new introduction has been the word effectively. There has been no such caveat before, and now the concept of working from home if you can effectively do so is something which employees and employers are trying to get to grips with. The truth is we do not know what would constitute as working effectively from home. There has at no stage been any further detail about how this should be interpreted. Taken in its most literal form, effective means just to give effect to something. But as we all know, in regular common parlance, it also means efficiency and also quality of work. We don't expect this rule to change on the 3rd of December because the rule was first introduced in the first tiered system. So as we return to a tiered system, there's no reason to suspect that the rule is going to change. I don't actually think we're going to get any clarification on what effectively is until if and when a high profile employee, employer gets this wrong and pushes the interpretation too far. Or possibly if an employer tries to force an employee to continue to work in the office, when the employee is not comfortable to do so and the employee believes that they can work effectively from home. In this circumstances, a case could be brought in the employment tribunal and then a judge would have to make a ruling on what the definition really is. That would of course be of very little help to the employer who is now on the receiving end of the employment tribunal judgment. We think it would be much better for, employee, for employers to tread with caution here and treat effectively as though there is a really high threshold. If your employers had been working from home successfully and with few issues at the start of the lockdown, it could be an unnecessary risk for employers to ask their employees to return to a physical workspace. That said, there might be some employees who are desperate to come back to work for whatever reason. So there should be a two-way conversation between employers and employees to figure out the working arrangement which would suit everybody best. That brings me on to my second topic, which is an employer's duty to their employers to provide a safe and healthy work environment. My colleague Emily is going to touch on the physicality of workspace later on this morning, so I'm going to focus on health and safety issues for employees whilst they work from home. It can be a common misconception that an employer's duty of health and safety only refers to the physical, work, to the physical workspace. However, this duty does continue beyond the physical workspace, including when an employee works from home. One of the most important aspects of the health and safety policies, which we have seen have a huge impact on the employee-employer relationship in recent months, is mental health. Employee, employers could view this as an opportune time to revisit their policies and make sure that there are provisions in place to ensure employees' mental health and well-being is protected as far as possible. This is, of course, in an, employee, in an employer's interest too, because it should help prevent burnout and will keep employees performing to their usual standards. Help could, for example, come in the form of a company-sponsored employment support programme, 
through which employees can confidentially reach out to counsellors, both for themselves and even maybe for their immediate family members. Employers could organise more internal social events. I think we're all quite fed up of Zoom and team meetings, but as the pandemic has gone on, there are much more creative ways to keep in touch. Even a fortnightly or monthly social catch up, whether within teams, departments or firm wide, can boost a lonely employee's well-being. It could be worth organising a wine tasting evening or a murder mystery event or an interactive game. Even simple things like a lunchtime book club or craft club can be really helpful for employees' well-being. Employers also need to be conscious of the fact that there is still a stigma about employees coming forward with mental health issues. We would therefore encourage supervisors to get in touch one-on-one -on -one with their more junior team members to check in and ask people how they're doing. It can be very difficult for employees to come forward to employers, so this makes the employer more proactive rather than waiting for employees to come forward if they're struggling. There is still a physical aspect of health and safety whilst working from home. We would recommend that employers carry out remote desk assessments to determine whether employees have the right equipment, such as desks, desk chairs and sufficiently large screens, to ensure that their physical safety is protected as far as possible. In reality, a lot of employers will have done this at the start of lockdown, but we are quite a few months on now, so it should be reconsidered and make sure that everybody's needs are the same as they were and are still being catered for. Finally, now that we know remote working isn't going anywhere and that it will likely continue even after the pandemic, employers are increasingly questioning whether, to what extent and how they can check up on their employees virtually. At the most basic level, we all have a right to a private and family life under the Human Rights Act, and any measures taken by an employer cannot inflame this. The number one thing to consider here is that employer, employers should inform and agree with their employees that they are going to be monitored. If an employer does not inform their employee that they are going to be monitored, this could likely amount to a breach of trust and confidence, which is imperative to an employment contract. If such a breach is committed, then the employee could actually walk away from the contract altogether and claim that the contract no longer exists. This is particularly difficult for financial industry because if an employment contract no longer exists, then any post-termination restrictions will cease to apply. Best practice would be for every employer to have a data protection policy in place, which clearly states what measures the employers have put in place for surveillance. My colleague Meta will be speaking about this later on today, so I won't go into this in any more detail now. There are certain circumstances in which an employer can monitor its employees. For example, if an employer believes that the employee is involved in criminal activity, if the employer is acting in the interests of national security, to main standards across telecommunications software, such as virus scanning, for quality control, business continuity and regulatory compliance, and if the business is required to monitor business transactions. As I say, even if monitoring is for one of the um, is for one of the reasons I've just outlined, employers should for the most part try to gain consent and go no further than is necessary. It may be reasonable, for example, for an employer to install surveillance software on their employees' equipment or monitor phone calls, emails and internet usage. Finally, if an employer is monitoring one employee, it really should monitor all of them, unless there is a specific reason, such as the one employee who is being monitored is subject to a disciplinary investigation. This is because if an employer cherry picks which employees to monitor and which not to, the employer could unwittingly be strayed into the territory of a discrimination claim, even if it doesn't mean to discriminate. For example, if most of the employees who are being monitored are women, that could amount to a sex discrimination claim. Or if most of the employees who are being monitored are over 50 years old, for example, then it could be an age discrimination claim. It is therefore best for employers, and probably even easiest for most employers, to monitor everybody rather than just some. Um, I hope that's given you at least a, a very brief understanding of how employers can protect both themselves and make the most of their workforce while everyone carries on working from home. Um, but if you do have any questions, then write them in the comments and I will do my best to answer them. Um, otherwise, thanks very much for listening. Thank you very much, Catherine. That was very interesting. Um, and yes, it, interesting thinking about what working effectively from home means. And I think that's going to become much more of a focus, as you say, over the next over the next few months. Um, Nigel's now going to talk to us about issues affecting uh, financial services businesses specifically and what they need to think about um, in terms of having everyone or most people working from home and complying with their regulatory obligations. So over to you, Nigel, to talk about that. Thank you very much, Janine. Thank you, Catherine. And good morning, everybody. 
as anybody who's been watching very carefully will have noticed I'm suffering from some of the challenges of working from home. You can see my dog trying to get in and out of the room as I've been trying, <laughs> trying to avoid eye contact with him. Most of the financial services has had to adapt to remote working. And, but I think it's a particular challenge in a fast moving industry like financial services, particularly in the sort of capital markets side where you've got trading floors normally full of people and, um, and a lot of things moving very, very quickly, um, a lot of trading, fast moving, price movement, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and this creates a particular challenge here because when you've got activities running into millions, if not billions of pounds, um, there are serious challenges in terms of keeping on top of that, regulating what people are doing, monitoring people's activities. Um, thinking particularly if you had a, that, I mean, the if you think back 20 odd years ago, or even more than that, to bet the bearings scenario where Nick Leeson covered up all sorts of bogus trades. Had he been working remotely, it would have been almost impossible to have found about what was going. Now, of course, financial services firms have much better um, anti-fraud software. They can detect patterns of trading, which looks suspicious. But all the same, it is still much harder to watch what's going on when you've got traders under great deal of stress in an office than when they're remote and you can't actually see what's going on directly. And you can't see unusual strands of behavior. So anyway, I'm going to talk about a couple of particular areas related to financial services. One of which is the senior managers and certification regime, the SNCR, and the other one is business continuity plans, both of which I think it's important to keep in mind what I've been talking about just at the beginning, which is where you've got sort of busy trading floors, rogue traders, um, unusual patterns of trading, and how much more of a challenge it is under the senior managers regime to do that remotely than when you're all in the office and you can see what's going on more easily. So just a quick reminder for anybody who's not familiar, the senior managers and certification regime was brought in for what are known as dual regulated firms. Now I say dual regulated, I mean regulated by the FCA and the PRA. The PRA is under the auspices of the Bank of England and the, the FCA and PRA effectively have different roles. That FCA is the Financial Conduct Authority. It's the main authority which deals with the conduct of uh, regulated institutions. By contrast, the PRA, uh, Prudential Regulatory Authority, is aligned to the Bank of England, effectively really sits with the Bank of England, and it is more around um, basically good conduct of the markets. So it's, it's, it's more about market integrity um, and the macro picture, whereas the FCA tends to focus much more on the micro and um, investor protection size of financial services. So the senior managers regime came in, as I said, for dual regulated banks in March 2016 and for what known as investment firms, which are single regulated firms, just regulated by the FCA in December 2019. And this rep replaced what was known as the approved persons regime or APA. Um, the senior managers regime brought in three layers of conduct. You had the senior managers regime, you have the certification regime, and then you have conduct rules for people lower down. So at the top of it, you have a small number of senior managers. And the idea of the senior managers regime is particularly relevant in sort of lockdown and remote working was that there, there, is no, there are no gaps of responsibility at the top of an organization between a group of senior managers. And you might have, say, 15 or 20 senior managers in a sort of sizable financial services institution between them. There, if anything goes wrong lower down the organization, one, at least one of them, maybe more of them, will be responsible for that. Um, in some of the previous trading scandals, the responsibility fell between the cracks. There was nobody at senior manager. Everybody said, well, I didn't know about this guy. Um, I didn't know about this rogue trader. That cannot happen under the senior manager's regime. So, as mentioned, it's it's, there's a more flexed regime for investment firms because generally sometimes they're small, some of them are larger, some are smaller. There are actually three tiers of investment firms. Investment firms are non-banks. So not banks, not large insurance companies. So basically companies like brokers, investment managers, um, and then independent financial advisors even. And there are three different regimes because if you think about a large broker, it's pretty much got all the infrastructure of a bank lower down in these smaller companies they really don't have that much infrastructure and they may only have maybe five or ten employees of whom two of them are senior managers so 
just going back to first lockdown, which all seems very familiar now, we're in second lockdown, as Janine would say, we planned this talk during the sort of lull between lockdowns and thought, well, this is all about going back to the office, and it turned out it's all going about going back to working from home. So in um, April 2020, um, both the PRA and FCA made a joint statement, um, and that was around the need for regulated firms to reorganise and redeploy their staff, and also to cover for furloughed managers, because if you take the view that some in, in a larger company, it's unlikely that large banks are going to furlough somebody as senior as a senior manager, because a senior manager would be like a head of risk, head of compliance, head of the local business, or head of any particularly large business line. Um, so these are people who are very unlikely to be furloughed. But if you think about a smaller firm like an, an IFA, where you've got five people and one of them is a sort of day active part time compliance officer, you might well furlough that person. Um, so what the um, FCA and PRA said is that they, they recognised that there was a need for um, some flexibility and that you might need to furlough a senior manager. Now, what they also said was you cannot have a gap. You, you can redeploy senior managers. You can appoint a new senior manager. They also flex something which is called the 12 week rule. So normally um, there are 12 weeks before, between appointing a senior manager and having to register that person with the FCA. And this has been relaxed now to 36 weeks in an attempt by the regulators to make life a little bit easier for regulated financial institutions. Um, the companies under the senior managers regime, firms have to have what's known as a statement of responsibility for each senior manager. And this, and this is all part of not allowing things to fall between the cracks. This is a clear statement. It's a regulated statement, which is filed with the FCA. And, and it basically sets out all of that manager's responsibilities. And I've gone through that exercise. There's also something called management responsibilities map. And I've gone through this exercise with quite a large financial institution as well as some smaller ones. And when you do that, you just have to make sure that there are no cracks and that what you find is quite the opposite. In the old empire building days before senior managers regime, people were forever saying, this part's mine and this is mine and that's mine. What I found when I was dealing with heads of risk and heads of compliance, they all trying to tell me this, I'm not responsible for this person, I'm not responsible for that. And there was a kind of the opposite of empire building. It was a kind of empire divesting, if you like where people were trying to divest themselves of responsibility for things they didn't feel completely comfortable about. If there were areas working under their, under the auspices of their team, they only wanted to be responsible for the things they really understood and the people they really trusted. So, um, so what happens if you're a furloughed manager? Well, what, what happens is that you're effectively dormant. So unless you're leaving the institution, you're working for, you don't need to be reapproved when you come back after after the furlough scheme. Um, and the, your firm does not need to file the form C, which is the form you file when a senior manager function um, leaves their post permanently, or even it's, it's not even long-term leave, say like a maternity leave. So it was, it's been deliberately left to be as um, flexible as possible. And then as mentioned before, under the senior manager's regime, there's a second lower regime called the um, called certification, certification regime, which is for people just below the level of senior manager. So people who can still do harm, so they call significant harm functions. Somebody where if they were to do their function wrong, could do significant harm to their firm. And the FCA has kicked the can a little bit down the road for the um, conduct rules for solo regulated firms. That's firms who are only um, regulated by one regulator, the FCA, smaller firms. So this was going to be brought in actually in the next couple of weeks time on the 9th of December. It's now been kicked down the road to the 31st of March next year. This allows firms more time to assess the fitness for priority of their certified staff, because this is where a senior manager is certifying that the people below them are able to do their jobs. And if you're not in the same office, that's going to be harder because you can't interview these people, talk to them. Because ultimately, as a senior manager, you are very, very responsible. You have nowhere to hide and you can only rely on the people below you to do their jobs properly. So I'm just going to say a couple of words about the business continuity plan because I appreciate I'm probably going over time. Um, that's a plan which you are required to have as a regulated firm to um, deal with, um, I guess, pandemics, if you like, stressful situations which you cannot be foreseen where you have to completely shunt your business. FCA expects all authorised firms to have an appropriate BCP and so that they can meet their regulatory obligations. 
and most firms would have activated their BCPs during the COVID-19 outbreak. And having worked in financial services for 20 years of my career, I can tell you, I can only remember one occasion where a BCP was ever used. And that was when I worked for a US firm who, and when Wall Street was flooded for a few days and there's nothing compared to COVID. So it shows we spent hours and hours and hours preparing this plan, thinking about all the worst case scenarios and assuming that we'd never actually have to activate it. So I think this has been an interesting time. And I think going forward, I would expect to see the FCA um, take great interest in the performance of BCPs um, going forward. And I would expect firms to take the whole planning process increasingly seriously going forward. So um, that's pretty bold, I want to say at the moment, but I'm interested in having questions later on. Back to you, Janine. Thanks, Nigel. I mean, just one thing I wanted to, to ask you about is with the business continuity plans, do you think are the regulators expecting people now that we've had a sort of few months of emergency um, working and um, working out how it's all going to be? Would, would Do you think there'll be people would be expected to have a look at those a bit more carefully now for the next few months to make sure that everything's effective because we've had a bit of time to get our to get our heads around everything? Well, I actually very much think so. I think there's, there's quite a strong expectation amongst the uh, financial regulated community that the SCA is going to um, um, delve into how business continuity plans are performed under pressure and to see how the process has worked because it's, un it's so unusual because they're so rarely activated. Um, we, when I was, I used to be a head of legal for a large broking firm and we had this business continuity plan that we'd all have to move to Brentwood if there was some problem with our office. And it never ever happened. Occasionally you send about 10 traders down there to work remotely and we said well does it work um and um and now we're all working remotely um i have had some interesting one thought i was just going to share with you um was that when you've got some of the very very rapid trading where you have to be very close to a very sort of high speed trading where you have to be close to a server i'm told that you can't do that as effectively from home as from an office where you've got where you've got the servers built and you're depending on uh, execution within nanoseconds. Um, my understanding is that that is not as effective from home and can't be as effective from home. Um, no, no, no matter how good, even if you have a very a top gaming laptop, as my son would recommend. Um, my understanding is that there are certain traders who went into work um, throughout the first lockdown on the basis that they couldn't work remotely effectively because of the type of trading they were doing. Interesting, interesting, the sort of, the sort of issues that will come up as Cathy was describing earlier in relation to what does effectively mean. I mean, that's a, that's a, a good example. Um, but now we're going to move on to looking at our premises and what things we need to think about there as we carry on working remotely, even if we have a few people in the office. So I'll hand over to Emily um, from our property services team who will um, tell us a bit about that. Thanks, thanks Janine. Um, so I'm going to be talking to you about general trends in the property arena, what we're seeing in the market right now and more practical issues too. So COVID-19 has led to a massive slowdown in active requirements from occupiers and agents have reported uh, a real increase in postponed deals. Many corporates seem to have delayed investment and as a reminder reopening offices requires social distancing measures and so a configuration of office layouts with about a 50 to 60 percent reduction in office capacity in in most cases the big company hq is obviously being challenged in light of what's going on right now the current pandemic and companies are having a good think about whether they actually need all their space they may want to give up some of their space or end their lease and move somewhere else that better fits their new needs. Some companies have closed some of their offices and a few have even moved to working from home permanently now. A lot of companies are anxious about having to pay rents when they're not going into their offices much or at all. And as touched on earlier, tenants may be looking for ways out of their lease, for example, by exercising existing break rights. And we've seen many, many negotiations between landlords and tenants for example, relating to rent reductions, rent free periods, paying monthly instead of quarterly to help with cash flow issues and also adding tenant break rights. And in return, 
landlords may be asking for things too, for example, an extension to the lease term. And we're seeing landlords and tenants broadly working together during this difficult time, working to balance their, their different interests. And we're seeing the different parties really pulling together. One particular clause that we are seeing tenants trying to add into lease documentation since the start of the pandemic, which you may want to consider if you're entering into a new lease, is a clause giving the tenant the right to a rent suspension or to end the lease in the event of any action by government due to COVID or another infectious disease. That means the tenant can't access their property. Generally, though, as expected, this has been strongly resisted by landlords so far, but um, time will tell, as, as Nigel mentioned earlier. Um, companies still need to keep in mind their tenant obligations under their leases, even if they're not in the office. For example, they may have obligations to have sufficient security in place if they leave the property vacant. I should add too that the Coronavirus Act contains express protections for business tenancies that restrict the landlord's ability to forfeit a lease during the relevant period, which began on 26th of March earlier this year. And it was actually due to end on 30th of June, but regulations were made to extend this period to 30th of September and then subsequently to 31st of December of this year. And during this time, particular restrictions apply in relation to relevant business tenancies. For example, the right of, of re-entry or forfeiture that I just mentioned for non-payment of rent in particular can't be enforced. And earlier this year, the government also introduced measures protecting commercial tenants from aggressive rent collection. And um, once lockdown is over, another ongoing key issue um, is making the office COVID secure, which, um, which Cathy briefly um, referred to earlier. So when people do go in, making the office safe for, safe for employees. Um, so for example, scheduling when people come in, um, so uh, temperature screening, um, uh, removing any shed items that are often touched, remote controls, things like that. And we've actually written a, a brief note on this, which we can circulate after this webinar. Uh, and I, I also um, wanted to highlight here that it should be, well, any increased costs incurred by landlords following more rigorous cleaning regimes or other schemes may be passed on to the tenants through the service charge where it's possible for them to do so. So something else to kind of look out for during this time. Great, so if you have any um, questions, as Janine mentioned, just pop them in the um, Q&A box and we can um, answer them at the end of the session. Thank you very much, Emily. Very interesting. I mean, one thing I, want, I was thinking about was in relation to shared business, um, buildings where there's shared occupation. Um, does, does everyone need to have temperature screening or how will that work? Or can you rely on the landlords um, doing it and paying for it via the service charge? What do you think the legal position is there? Perhaps that's a question for Cathy. I'm not sure. <laughs> um, um, well, I think um, from the kind of um, property point of view, um, I think it will be very much down to the um, individual tenants in their own demise, what 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 they're going to do, and their, and Kathy will probably uh, be able to to kind of expand on this more. Um, what what their duties, um, but then the landlords the landlords themselves might um, um, enforce particular measures for the whole building and for the common areas in particular which they're responsible for, and um, and then. And then that will be the cost of that will be filtered down through the service charge, most likely. I see. Thank you very much. Cathy, do you have any comments on that? Um, no, other than to say that I, I completely agree with everything Emily said and everything essentially is up to the employer and consultation with employees as to how they can best make their workplaces secure. And like Emily said, it's, it's often going to be a case of just making sure that everything's particularly clean. Um, be careful in particular about office phones. It might be better for all employees just to use their own mobile phones, because that's something which obviously is a breeding ground for COVID. So everyone should just be a bit more careful and um, perhaps installing um, screens between desks, which could obviously um, have quite a big impact on landlords. So as Emily said, it's gonna be quite a collaborative approach. Thank you very much. 
Okay, so we'll now move on to Meta, who's going to talk to us about uh, data protection issues, um, which is something which is obviously coming into focus as people are working away from the office. Thanks, Janine. Yes, I mean, I think it's fair to say that the pandemic has been probably the single greatest incentive for rapid digital change across businesses in pretty much every sector. Um, and I also further to that, I mean, this kind of rapid change is just bound to attract data protection and cybersecurity issues that are going to need a bit more thought, particularly as we phase into this longer term solution and think about how to deal with it. Um, I, I'm going to sort of highlight the main problems as I see them in sort of two broad categories, the first of which is some more infrastructure and hardware. Um, and possibly the most obvious one to start with is talking about the difference between office Wi-Fi networks and employees own home networks. Um, you know, if you're in the office, the IT managers can control pretty much, you know, the security of the office Wi-Fi with antivirus solutions, firewalls, blacklisted IP addresses if they want to, and basically put in place proper intrusion prevention systems. With everybody working at home, however, without all those security protections that office systems can afford, workers and therefore businesses are just going to be far more vulnerable to cyber attacks unless proper things are put in place to deal with this. One of the reasons for this, I think, is probably because suddenly we're very dependent on each employee's independent internet connectivity. I mean, we've all been on calls where someone's Wi-Fi goes down and they have to tether or, you know, use public networks to rejoin the call. Um, and the problem with public networks is that they are insecure and vulnerable to hackers who can intercept data being transmitted across them. So businesses need to really think about a secure approach to communicating important information um, and that might take the form of secured applications for file sharing and emails or using secure VPNs so that remote workers can access the work system securely. Another issue is BYO devices. Um, you know, employees often use more than one when working from home um, and each device is basically a potential entry for system threats. So if personal devices are being used and data isn't properly encrypted on them or stored in a secured way, there's just an increased risk of a data breach. Um, you know, if something's being saved locally, for example. And now your work issued laptop might be okay, but if you're using your personal mobile phone to access emails, then there are obviously problems with that too. Um, so basically employers, again, need to ensure that staff are actually complying with all the kind of security policies that govern the use of when it's appropriate to use personal devices, if at all, if you're going to be handling work related tasks. Um, sharing hardware is more common now that we're all working at home as well. So, you know, other household members um, using same printers, same devices, and this just basically increases the risks of, of data tr transmissions being unauthorized or data breaches. Um, for example, you know, if, if you've got authentications stored or login details stored on your laptop and someone else borrows it to do something, that's one example. Um, but also something to think about is, you know, printing physical records of data at home. Um, most of us don't have lockable filing cabinets or industrial shredders or confidential waste bins at home in the same way that we might have access to in the office. Um, so this is really something that needs to be thought about more, more in more detail. And you hear stories about um, businesses sending sort of, you know, lorries with shredders on them around to employees' houses but it's every kind of so, so often, but this isn't really a sustainable way to deal with it. So there need to be, needs to be some thought given to whether we're just going to ban printing outright. I mean, some people just need to be able to look at documents, particularly if they're really long. So um, there needs to be a system in place, basically. Um, and, and moving on from hardware to sort of more kind of employee um, human error and practice uh, themed points. Um, one of which is that there's just an increased reliance on email and um, messaging to communicate data that might ordinarily have been done in person by just normal conversation. Um, you know, if you're in the office with someone and you've got something sensitive to, to discuss or run past somebody, the odds are that you would have just popped into their office and, and, and done it just face to face. Um, now, you know, it's just harder to do that and more of the stuff is being committed to writing and this really comes into play with things like data subject access requests. Essentially, the bottom line is I think everybody needs to remember that if you're not happy for everybody else to read what you're talking about, it shouldn't be committed to writing in the first place. Um, because just because it's on a chat function doesn't mean that it won't fall within the remit of, of a data subject access request search. Um, and on the theme of chat software, um, you know, some of these, for example, WhatsApp um, are stored in the US and that is a potential data breach following the demise of the Privacy Shield framework recently um, in the Schrems 2 decision in the European courts. So really, this needs to be looked at as well. You know, are there, are there locally hosted options that you could be using? Um, and, you know, does, does the firm have rules about which chat functions can be used to discuss work related matters at all? Um, and if not, then probably these ought to be put in place. Uh, Moving on to sort of broader confidentiality issues, you know, can other members of your household overhear calls? 
Um, lots of us have to share space to work now, you know, whether it's someone walking through or whether you're all sitting around the kitchen table working. And, you know, there are some things that you can be doing, uh, you know, employers can issue headsets, or at least, you know, they can you know, overhear half a conversation rather than the whole thing. Um, but really, I think main, in the main, it's just making employees aware, possibly through training, just make them alert as to, you know, what kind of conversations need to be dealt with more sensitively and, and think about what the best way of achieving that is, whether it's to remove yourself from that space or go outside, or there are some things that just need to be dealt with very sensitively. Um, I think overall, basically compliance is just more of a challenge when people aren't physically in the office. I was quite interested in the results of Nigel's poll earlier. Um, you know, training is going to need to be given and now that has to be virtual. Um, people need to be educated on what to do in the event of a cyber attack um, and what potential risks they should be watching out for. You know, suspicious emails, phishing, malware. We've all heard stories about that being on the rise um, during the pandemic. And I think possibly this is due to the fact that people are just more often in their comfort zones when they're working from home. But that doesn't mean we don't need to be just as vigilant when things happen. Um, so I think just to finish off, I was going to sort of sum up by giving a couple of tips about enhancing security for remote working. The first of which is possibly the most obvious, which is to review all data handling practices. I mean, this is a really good time to be doing that anyway, because of Brexit and all the changes that's bringing. Um, and the European regulators and, and commission have just issued a whole load of new guidance and, and standard clauses and that kind of thing. So this is going to be affecting us all, whether we like it or not. Um, but things like, you know, carrying out data privacy impact assessments on the implications of, of employees working from home in the long term. Um, and then revising data security and home working policies accordingly. I think it's probably fair to say that most companies had something like those in place anyway, but they might not necessarily have catered for all staff working remotely at the same time for long periods of time. And they really need to cover, therefore, all the things I was talking about earlier. So, you know, VPN only access to reduce cyber breach risks, um, you know, the extent to which BYO devices can be used or banned, um, consider what chat program functionality to include in sort of sanctioned software. Um, and then dealing with things like printing confidential waste, depending on you know, what those employees are likely to have access to or need. Um, and then also things like you know, data breach policies and procedures need to be updated as well. It's, it's so important that everybody knows what to do and who to contact if something happens now that we don't have the option of just asking your office mate, oh God, this has happened, what do I do? Um, you know, we really need to know this. We, know where to, we need to know where to access these policies if something does happen, because again, you know, you've still got this 72 hours to inform the ICO. So, you know, the longer it takes you to report it to, you know, the, the data, the person with data protection responsibility at your firm, the less time they have to look into it and to make a report if necessary. So this, which brings me on to my next point, which is that, you know, there's no good updating policies in a vacuum. We really need to sort of drill employees on how to protect their devices um, and how to follow breach procedures, etc. And then I think the, the final thing I just wanted to flag was, um, you know, most businesses have some, some degree of cybersecurity liability insurance already, but really, you know, this just might need to be reviewed. Um, working from home can attract greater risks that just will necessitate more cover um, or, or just making sure that you're covered for the things that you might need to be covered for. So just just have a quick look at those, um, those clauses in the, uh, in the insurance policies. And I think that's probably everything I wanted to cover. But obviously, um, as everybody else has said, I'm very happy to answer questions at the end. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, that was very interesting. Just picking up on one point you made with a comment from me with my disputes hat on, which is that um, the other thing to bear in mind about chat functions is that they are no less disclosable when you are in litigation than any, anything else. Um, and therefore people need to be careful about that and careful about ensuring that anything that's privileged is, is clearly marked as privileged. Absolutely. Um, although, as we all know, that doesn't necessarily mean it is or it isn't, but um, it does help um, when managing the process uh, if, you, if you've done that. So yes, and just another thing to think about and be careful of when using chat functions rather than popping your head around someone's door. Exactly. Um, but now moving on to uh, Ryan, who's going to talk to us a little bit about managing our commercial issues and our contract issues um, to try and avoid disputes where possible and resolve them um, without too much cost and spending money on either me or Ryan to do so. <laughs> You know, it very much goes against our better judgment, but at the same time, we're trying to um, to influence people to do the right thing. Um, thanks, Janine. Uh, yeah, virtually every business in the world has had to uh, adapt to restrictions of varying kinds that impact on when they trade, where they trade, and how they trade. Um, the principal focus of this webinar is on the where, but that issue obviously impacts on the how and to some extent the when as well. So as with all changes to the context in which we work, um, should that be regulatory, technological or physical, and Meta mentioned Brexit being another good example, um, all businesses have to take a careful look at their commercial contracts and see if they're still fit for purpose. 
So the types of contracts I have in mind can be split into two categories that are in the poll question. Agreements with suppliers, particularly long-term agreements, and agreements with clients, including standard terms and conditions. Starting with supplier agreements. Um, with the obvious issues concerning real estate and literal office space, um, and we've covered those with, with Emily already, comes um, a set of commercial agreements with suppliers that were designed to service a workforce working relatively predictable hours that is largely in one or a few places over which the business has control. Just a few obvious examples would be um, equipment leasing agreements. How many scanners, printers, monitors do you need now compared to February 2020? Catering contracts, do you have to contribute towards a canteen for workers in your building? Um, building access and security, uh, is there still a need for a 24-hour service reception in your, your office space that has a substantial amount of annual cost attached to that? So when thinking about these kinds of agreements, particularly those into which your business is locked in, or at least you appear to be locked in um, for a long-term commitment, um, they might no longer fit your needs uh, or now seem like a waste of resources. And there are a number of points that should be scrutinized in the context of those agreements. Um, exit options is the obvious first area to look at. Agreements with suppliers will typically have termination provisions. And if they don't, they would usually be terminable on reasonable notice which could be a subject of a talk in itself, but um, even if it says nothing there, there is the, um, the prospect of, of terminating most agreements. Um, in general, the longer the term of the agreement, usually the longer the notice period for termination, if it is not a fixed term contract. And also, do you need a reason to terminate? If so, has that condition been satisfied? Are there only specific dates, for example, anniversary days on which you can terminate or are particular forms of notice required? Or is there an auto renewal perhaps that you don't uh, want to take effect, but you have to do something active to make sure that doesn't happen. Also, it's important to remember that a clean termination right might make it easier to negotiate better terms with the same supplier or look to the wider, undoubtedly highly competitive market for a better deal. Whereas if one tries to terminate without a proper right to do so, that can turn a situation completely on its head and hand a claim to the supplier and either Janine or I will be defending you in those circumstances. So what do you want to do if you um, want to vary what you get from your supplier? Well, this is obviously an amendment to the contract in general terms. In most cases, these will need to be negotiated and agreed, but it is worth looking at contracts to see whether at least some part of the service is directly within your control rather than something that has to be agreed. For example, is the agreement in reality just a framework for a series of repeat orders that you could just stop or vary within a very short time frame, but you just haven't really thought about it that way because it has gone on so long? Um, the overarching point is you just don't know your options until you actually check the terms. And there might be separate legal points that can be made as well, some of which I will um, get into shortly. So most of what I've said so far focuses on contracts where the supplier is ready, willing, and able to provide the services. But what about where that is not the case? On the one hand, this might give one a right to terminate the contract early for non-performance. On the other hand, you might be dying to terminate for non-performance, but the supplier has a legal excuse um, whereby the contract allows them not to perform in certain extreme circumstances. Uh, those types of clauses are typically known as force majeure clauses, and I will discuss those in more detail in the context of client agreements um, shortly. There's also the specific legal concept that might come into play in certain situations, frustration. In basic terms, a contract can be frustrated, i.e. effectively set aside without allocating fault to either party. If it is impossible to perform or performing it would be radically different to what the parties had in mind when the contract was formed. Frustration has had a lot of press or, or at least legal press in the context of lockdown. Um, where the ability to do various things has been restricted by, by government orders. However, in, in my view, events such as lockdown that are temporary in nature are generally unlikely to be enough to frustrate a long-term contract that goes well beyond the, the period that we're living through now. But again, it does depend on the specific um, provisions of the contract to some extent. Also, just briefly, um, it should hopefully go without saying that no matter what a contract says, it cannot force a party to do something that would be illegal. Um, now, what is law and what is guidance is, is a whole thing in itself to do with um, lockdown, but just the general principle is, is worth mentioning again. And lastly, on suppliers, um, I should mention that looking forward, when considering new contracts with suppliers, 
it is worth carefully considering whether they can be structured as a series of long-term contracts, for example, or have relatively flexible termination provisions. In the changing business landscape, even post-vaccine, it will probably be some time before the full long-term changes to our working practices are apparent. Keeping your business nimble with flexible commitments um, seems like a very sensible approach when thinking about your agreements um, with your suppliers. Now turning to agreements with clients. Um, most financial services businesses are likely to have highly developed and up-to-date agreements with their clients. That's one upside of being in a highly regulated sector. However, the unprecedented nature of the pandemic and the government actions that have followed do mean that some previously neglected, people call them boilerplate terms, um, should be dusted off and given some thought for the future. Um, that does include bespoke client agreements and standard terms and conditions. For today's purposes, I'm just going to speak to some examples, but a contract review either internally or by external legal advisors is always a good idea every so often anyway. And the potential benefit of that is multiplied when the context in which most existing contracts were drafted and agreed is wildly different um, to now and most likely different in at least some material respects permanently. So what sort of things am I thinking of? Um, how much do your contract terms depend on having a physical office and do they really need to? Um, in particular, where do notices need to be sent or received? Do they need to be in hard copy to from a physical address? During certain periods of lockdown, that might not be possible. Um, with a dispersed workforce long term, it's certainly less straightforward. And is there provision for that to happen electronically instead um, with time and cost efficiencies that that provides anyway? Um, and that brings me to force majeure. Um, as mentioned earlier, in relation to supplier contracts, and it, and it does apply to them uh, as well, um, if it's actually in the contract. Um, it's a very important point, and it's misunderstood often as well, I think, because of perhaps um, different meanings or uses in different jurisdictions. Um, most financial services businesses are in the relatively privileged position of being able to operate almost seamlessly with large scale remote working. However, anyone that's called a bank or insurance company, for example, in the last nine months will know staff availability and increased client demand can impact on the speed and perhaps the scope and quality of service offered to clients. With that in mind, businesses would be wise to look very carefully at their contracts to see one, do they have a force majeure clause? And two, if so, would that clause be effective to potentially absolve them of failures of performance that might arise due to the pandemic of today? or pandemics or similar of the future? Or is it perhaps restricted to sort of flood, tempest and insurrection and phraseology that we sometimes see in, in older style versions of those types of clauses? Um, if the agreements with the consumer, obviously there will also be specific requirements, regulatory requirements to meet um, on those sorts of clauses. But just digging down a little in, more into force majeure, like frustration, it has had a lot of press in the last nine months. However, one point that should be emphasized above all is that force majeure in English law is not a standalone legal principle. It is just a type of contractual clause. So if your business contracts say nothing about temporary, extreme, unprecedented events and treating poor performance differently in those circumstances, traditionally called acts of God, um, then force majeure does not come into play. The clause is not there to be relied upon. If that is the case, it would be worth addressing that, um, at least in contracts going forward. Again, a bigger topic than what I have time for, but there might also be uh, material adverse change clauses in certain agreements. Um, they're particularly common in loan agreements and they weren't, as I say, an entire talk in themselves, but depending on their wording, they could be highly relevant to how a contract should or can operate in the different economic environment in which we find ourselves. Though, as a word of caution, the cases typically emphasize that the impact on the specific parties involved rather than the wider economy is, is usually what you'd be focused on. But I think in pandemic terms, who knows? Um, so as I've mentioned, no doubt there are many contract terms that are worth a closer look. Anything to do with guaranteeing timing of delivery of services, how quickly an instruction will be executed, for example. Um, but the general point about thinking again, particularly regarding terms that never seemed particularly interesting before, um, could help stave off major issues and potentially claims in the future. And if I could finish just on two short points. Um, at the height of the pandemic, the government published guidance on responsible contractual behaviour. Um, in essence, the guidance was strong encouragement from the government for contracting parties in all sectors to act 
in their words, responsibly and fairly. This covered issues like extension of time to perform, exercising termination rights, claiming breach of contract too soon, um, and various other things. However, it is important to know that the guidance is just that, it's guidance, it has no force of law. And particularly, whilst fair and reasonable behaviour is generally a good idea, um, I do not see any judge taking that much account of it. And um, frankly, uh, in my view, it, it's rather toothless. Um, the words of the specific contract and the general law are still what will dictate rights and obligations um, under contracts. Plus, in the financial services context, the guidance does not apply to the effect it really applies to anything, um, to financial market transactions um, specifically. And lastly, um, some viewers might have heard about recent changes in the law that have had an impact on certain termination rights in contracts for the supply of goods or services. Those changes have rendered clauses that allow for termination in the event of an insolvency unenforceable. So those clauses cannot be used by service providers, for example, to terminate, um, leaving them in the unenviable position of having to keep supplying services to insolvent clients. However, there are various exceptions and to wrap up on an optimistic note, um, the good news for this group in particular is that financial services businesses, whether they be the supplier or the client, are largely exempt from that change to the law. So those types of termination clauses should still work for financial services businesses um, if they want to use them to terminate certain contracts with insolvent counterparties. And with that, I will say I'm also happy to answer questions and back to Janine. Thank you very much, Ryan. Um, lots to think about there, I think, as we as we move forward. Um, one thing that occurred to me was um, perhaps another situation that might arise is that um, you would have a, a contract that you're desperate that someone should perform because you can't source whatever it is somewhere else, um, but they've decided not to. I mean, what are your rights there? I presume mean, you'd be thinking about applying for specific performance or an injunction to get an interim um, remedy to enforce that. Is that yeah, like I, I think going back to sort of the general um, point, absent them being able to to look to a specific clause in the agreement, like a force majeure clause, that would sort of um, the way I put it would like absolve them of responsibility. Uh, what I would also add to that is it would usually require them to give notice of the force majeure event, and um, for for them to have that sort of grace period, if you like. Um, if they could rely on that, then um, you probably cannot um, enforce for whatever the period of force majeure would be. Again, I would interrogate quite closely whether the force majeure clause actually is applicable, like the fine fine terms of those, um, especially in a world that was not anticipating pandemic or lockdown, depending on what the event is characterised as, would be an interesting thing in itself. But leaving that to one side, if there is no such clause, I think um, your normal contractual rights would apply. And, and if they have difficulty getting um, things from elsewhere, um, to some extent, that's their problem. Um, now, if they can, at its height, of course, they might say, look, it's literally impossible to perform, and then you get into frustration, but I think that's a high bar. Um, and if it is, like, literally possible in the, just, like, 1% even possible, I think um, the courts are generally, um, in sort of the historic case law at least, uh, quite likely to construe frustration extremely narrowly and say, you know, they made the bargain if it's harder for them to perform or more expensive to get it from someone they didn't intend. Um, so be it, that's just the bargain. Yeah, interesting. And also, I mean, you'd have to show, I suppose, as well, that damages aren't an adequate remedy. There may be arguments yeah. about that as well, where they'd say, well, you can you can just, um, it is, it's gonna cost you X or Y, but you can see yeah, some situations where that might not be possible. Um, mm. We have a question from our audience, um, and I think this is one for for Kathy. So it's, um, if you're working from home, can can employees work from abroad if it suits them to do so for family reasons or for um, personal reasons? They prefer not to be locked down in in a flat in London or whatever, but to to go home to their family in another country. Is that possible? Um, yeah, I mean, first of all, thanks for the question, and it is a very interesting question which we're seeing more and more. Um, I mean, the basic answer is that you're going to need to talk to your employer. Um, it could be that working from elsewhere for a brief time, such as two weeks, could be agreed. Um, but if we were in the physical workspace, you wouldn't kind of just go abroad to work without telling your employer. So it really shouldn't be any different when you're working from home. Um, so also another thing which might help employers be a bit more amenable to this is if you went to, if you went to them and said, OK, I need to be away for two weeks, but I'm happy to use some of my holiday in that time. So it actually reduces the amount of time where they're going to have you working away. Um, 
If you are looking to work abroad for a longer period of time, then you should consider that you're going to probably have a place of work clause in your contract. Um, so a significant amount of time is very likely to change that contract. And whenever there is a variation in contract, obviously you need agreement from both parties. Um, so again, you'll need to go to your employer and try and get them to agree so that it works for both of you. Um, there are also probably going to be some tax implications, but I think that I've, I've got an eye on the time and I think it's beyond the scope of this um, question anyway. So I wouldn't be surprised if your employer started talking to you about that. So don't be surprised if it comes up. Um, so essentially the, the answer is if in doubt, then talk to your employer. Uh, I think it is probably quite possible that employers are already starting to look into this point and there might be a policy which is emerging which you're not aware of. So um, it's always best to be open and honest with your employer and just ask them if there's something they can, they can do to help you. Um, but as I say, I think this is going to come up a lot more. So there'll be more clarity, I think, in a few months' time. Yeah, thank you very much. Yes, the tax issue is coming more to the forefront as I think not just employees, but some self-employed people and business owners are perhaps working abroad for longer than they normally would. And I think there are, you, there are time periods usually in relation to that for the various authorities worldwide where it depends how long you've been somewhere is important. Um, so I think, yes, that is a, that's an issue that um, it's not it, within the scope of this webinar, but which um, is important if you're looking at working from abroad. Um, well, thank you very much. And I don't think we've got any more questions from the audience. Does anyone in the panel have a question for any of the other panelists? No, but I would just add that for the last question, there may also be data protection issues involved in it, depending on where you are um, and the adequacy status or not, or how we regard the local data protection laws, but that could be an issue that needs to be dealt with there as well. So it's worth discussing that with your employer before you do anything. A very good point. Thank you very much, Meta, for, for that. Um, so unless anyone else has got any other comments to make, I think we'll sort of give it five seconds to see if anyone has anything to say. Um, I'll just wrap up by saying that we will, of course, be circulating a note of all the key points covered by this webinar. Um, and that if you have any questions that you want to ask any of us individually, do give us a call or send us an email. We'd be happy to deal with them. Um, and yes, just hoping that soon we'll be able to have our originally planned webinar, which is the webinar which helps you all navigate your way back into the office, at least in, in some form and not before before too long. <laughs> um, but thanks everyone for attending and thank you to all the panellists for, for that really helpful um, overview of everything we need to be thinking about. Thank you very much. <laughs>